Okay, hello everybody. My name is Peter Quinn and this is uh, Critical Thinking in Context. So I'd just like to say before I begin that this is my very first academic presentation, so please be kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> so because this is a critical thinking, I'd like to say, has anyone noticed the critical thinking fallacy I've already uh, been guilty of? Closed on that. <laughs> really? um, the critical thinking fallacy is uh, appeal to pity. So I'm here presenting my ideas, my arguments. According to you know real critical thinking, you shouldn't think better of my argument because oh I'm so I'm so I, I don't really know about you know it's only my first time. So oh can you go to the next one? Yeah. So, appeal to pity is a fallacy in which someone tries to win support for an argument or an idea by exploiting his or her opponents, you're my opponents, feelings of pity or guilt. Did that work? Well, no? You've, yeah. just, you've yeah. just begun, though. Yes, I'm trying to get pity. <laughs> I'm trying to build up my pity first, you know, so then when I make a mistake later, you go, oh, it's only his first time, it's okay. Okay. So, okay. go to the next. So, Today I'll talk about critical thinking in context. So, I teach using this book, Asking the Right Questions. So, books like this do a good job of explaining what critical thinking is, uh, how to become a good critical thinker, where, and uh, how to develop your critical thinking skills. But one question it doesn't answer very well is, when should we do critical thinking? So, a lot of the critical thinking textbooks, they're, I think they have so much zeal for critical thinking, that they actually don't put it in a proper context. They don't tell us when we should do critical thinking and when we shouldn't do critical thinking. So the question that this presentation is answering is, when should we do critical thinking? Putting critical thinking in a context of our lives. So I'll break this talk into five parts. First, my teaching situation. Second, the essential characteristics of critical thinking. Three, the lack of context in critical thinking textbooks. Four, two ideas that help me put critical thinking into a wider context and a teaching activity to teach some of this to students. So I teach first my teaching situation. I teach in Temple University, Japan's continuing education department. I teach criti critical thinking skills 101. So this, this course is under this focus on specific language skills, focus on thinking. So most of the students, the vast majority, are non-native speakers. Most of them have come from these English language programs and are moving towards these more difficult content courses. So it's kind of a you know, content-based language learning. So we meet every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. So they're very motivated for two hours, and there are 10 sessions. So we have to go through things quite quickly. So, this is the textbook I use, Asking the Right Questions. So this textbook defines critical thinking as an awareness of a set of interrelated critical questions, the ability to ask and answer critical questions in an appropriate manner, and a desire to actively use the critical questions. So can you see why the book is called Asking the Right Questions? Right? Critical thinking is a process of questioning. So, okay. So every chapter goes through a different critical question. So, for example, what are the issue and conclusion? What are the reasons for it? The phrases are ambiguous. And there are seven more. I put it on your handout so it won't hurt your eyes. So every week, basically, we go through another chapter and look, discuss another question. And, oh, a quick plug from my blog. This is the blog that I use for the class. The address is on the handout. So there are different, I have a different page for each chapter. And I have the handouts that I use for each chapter. And I have extra material that I may or may not use in class. So if you want to see what I'm doing in this class, please take a look at my blog. So let me ask you one question before we go to the next slide. It, when you think critical thinking, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? What? What, how? What, how? Okay. Anything else? BS detector. BS detector. <laughs> Okay, so 
Okay, nobody said the answer I wanted you to say, but that's okay. Uh, you, something like logic, maybe what, how, mm -hmm. or BS detector, right? But, so what a question is. Hmm, yeah. But actually, maybe now, because I found it from Brian's talk, you know, I'm, a, not, I'm an NFP, right? Feeler, I'm not a thinker. So actually, if you go on to the next slide, I think, yes, of course, logic is an essential component of critical thinking, but I think even more important are being curious, being open-minded, and also being self-reflective. So a lot of people, you can be logical, just attacking other people's thoughts. Or you can be illogical just ramming your opinion down someone's throat. But being curious, open-minded, and last, being self-reflective, looking at your own thoughts and also your own way of thinking critically is, I feel, the essential component of critical thinking. If you're not doing this, no matter how logical you are, to me, you're not doing critical thinking. You're just, uh, you know, attacking with logic. So let's listen to a short video from Penn Gillette, a uh, author. Oh, I got no sound. Yeah. Go. Try it again. I believe that your goal, without condescension and without manipulation, is to tell the truth as you see it. And I align myself when the truth as I see it overlaps with an atheist movement or a skeptic movement or a libertarian movement or Cato. Uh, I'm very happy to get on board there. But I don't spend any time thinking about what we're trying to accomplish. And I believe that's really important because if I think, how do I convince this person? I'm sitting across from someone that I've met. And in my mind, if I'm thinking, how do I get that person to become a libertarian? I believe at that moment I am a pig. I am a bad person. I am doing the wrong thing. I should be thinking, what do I believe? What's in my heart? I try to say that, and that person says that back. Because it's possible they're right. And if I'm trying to convince them, I have not given any possibility of them being right. When you say to the person condescendingly, well, how do you think UFOs could have gotten here? That's not a real question. You're trying to manipulate them. And it's possible that the person sitting across from me has information on Roswell that will change my whole point of view. It's very unlikely. I don't really entertain it. But in theory, I want to be open to that. So my brand of uh, libertarianism, if you will, is I love having people preach to me. I don't want to ever become the person that's trying to change their mind. And the difference is so subtle, as I think, outside of me to be non-existent. The difference between telling the truth as you see it from your heart with passion and trying to win people over is, I guess the technical term would be an, an RCH, just the slightest possible difference. But to me, it's very important that I try to stick with that. So okay. I, uh, I don't really, times the answer's going to be no. You know, if, if yeah, someone is, and you're a police yeah. person, and you have a gun, and they are the okay, okay, style it. person I am, mm -hmm. I believe in. Uh, it's not the style person I am. I believe that you just keep saying the truth as you see it as often as you can. You change your mind every time you see yourself as being wrong. And you hope that that truth will win out in the end. And I think it does. I think that the okay. major quality you need... So I think the interesting points from this are you tell the truth as you see it. So it's that kind of open-mindedness about your own ideas. And uh, you change you change your mind anytime you think you say yourself as being wrong, and actually he is very very controversially said you should never try to convince another person because then you must think that you are right. That's kind of going even very far. So I think that's that's the basis of critical thinking. If you don't have that kind of open mind, you're not really thinking critically. So I was enjoying teaching this class a bunch of times, and then of course something went wrong. The student asked a difficult question. So I was in front of the class. I was talking about, you know, to think critically about an issue, 
you have to look at all the reasons, you have to look at all the evidence with an open mind, you also have to look at your own biases. It's a lot of work. And a student said to me, teacher, when do you do this? And uh, I had to like stop for a second to think of an example. So I, I, the example I gave was, I think critically when I'm preparing my lessons. You know, it's my job, so I try and think about, okay, what's the material? How are the students reacting the, to the material? I think about my own biases. For example, I have a bias towards you know, trying to put too much in at one time, which I have to be careful of. <laughs> so I gave that example, but after the class, this question kept going in my mind, and it disturbed me for two reasons. The first, because I thought, do you have a critical thinking teacher? Do, am I really thinking critically enough? You know? And another thing was, this question shows that the student doesn't understand how critical thinking fits into their life. I think the critical thinking textbooks are so like, you must do critical thinking all the time. Critical thinking is the best. And if you're doing something all the time, then when do you do it? Do you understand? There's no context. They, you have to explain to me when to do it and when not to do it. Oh, so I started thinking about this textbook. What kind of context does it put critical thinking into? And it puts critical thinking into a context in three ways. The first is it looks at uh, different thinking styles. One is panning for gold, which is critical thinking, asking questions, forming your own conclusions. The other thinking style is what they call the sponge, which is just whatever you come in contact with, you absorb and you believe. And if you do this, you become a mental slave of the other person. So the conclusion, of course, is always do panning for gold, never be a sponge. So that's some context, I guess. And the next one, next context is the context of our busy lives. You know, like the student says, when do you do this? We're always busy. So a quote is, your time is valuable. Before taking time to critically evaluate an issue, ask the question, who cares? So we don't have to critically evaluate every single issue in the world. Thank God. Okay, the next, the last conversation, the next context it puts in is a social. We are social beings. So, because critical thinking is a social activity, we need to consider how other people are likely to react to us when we ask them questions about their beliefs and conclusions. Usually, I find people react negatively when you ask them critical questions. So, their solution is verbal strategies. They have, I have two here and there are six more on your handout. So the verbal strategies are, for example, ask the other person whether there is any evidence that would cause him to change his mind, and ask why the person thinks the evidence on which you are relying is so weak. So these are good strategies, but it doesn't explain what you do when these strategies don't work. So it's, it's unclear. So, next. So these are the three ways it puts it in context. First, it shows different thinking styles. So, of course, you should always think critically. It puts it in the context of our busy lives. So, at least we don't have to think critically about everything. And it puts it into a social context and gives us some verbal strategies. So, that's some kind of context, but it's still not really clear for me, you know, when we should do critical thinking and when not. So, I started thinking, trying to find ideas to put critical thinking into a wider context. And I, came, I found two interesting ideas. One was this book, the Aims of Argument by Chrysias and Chanel, and another is a talk by John Cleese on creativity. So the book is called The Aims of Argument because there are different kinds of argument, and each kind of argument has a different aim. So for example, this book shows four different kinds of argument. Inquiry, which is critical thinking. It seeks the truth, and it's in a context either by yourself with friends or colleagues, an informal setting, a dialogue between people, and asking questions. Convincing is like uh, academic presentations. Right? You seek to prove your thesis, right? less intimate. Oh, sorry, we're not all friends. Right? And we're doing a monologue, which is what I'm doing right now. And I'm making my case. Persuading is kind of like marketing. right? It seeks action. The action is usually by this. Right? And of course, it's... Uh, more public, everyone is part of marketing, and the, the situation is they want you to buy something, and it appeals to reason and emotion. And the last is negotiation, dealing with different groups in conflict. So actually here you're not worried about the truth, rather you're just worried about consensus. 
and the audience are polarized by differences and they need to cooperate. And this process is give and take. So you might not actually agree with the other person, but you might just get, get rid of one point. You might drop a point. So this, I found this very useful for me. Because first of all, it puts critical thinking into some context. Oh, OK, it should be by myself or with a small group. We should be having an informal dialogue and asking questions. Now I have a mental picture in my mind of people doing critical thinking. So this is useful for me. And then I can see the other things that aren't critical thinking. So also it shows to me that critical thinking is not the only kind of argument you, you could be doing. Right? So for example, I started off this presentation with a logical fallacy. But if you look at it as persuading, maybe it was good persuading. Right? I was using emotion to persuade you. Right? So if you look at it as critical thinking, it was a fallacy. If you look at it as persuading, maybe it was successful persuasion. And one other thing this explains to me is why I can't find any critical thinking videos on the internet. So what I mean by is, go to YouTube and you can type in critical thinking. You see a lot of videos of people talking about critical thinking. A lot of people convincing you about critical thinking. A lot of people persuading you about critical thinking. You, I can't find any video of anybody actually doing critical thinking. Why is that? So I also teach debate. Right? And so debate, type in debate. You can see a lot of debates on YouTube, right? Uh, political leaders debating an issue, some philosophical or scientific debate, you know, and the usual talking heads debate. Debate is very easy to put into a context. Critical thinking is difficult because we can't see it, usually. Critical thinking usually isn't videotaped. I think the reason is because in, if you're really doing critical thinking, you're changing your mind. And nobody wants to be videotaped changing their mind. Right? It's the same thing with negotiation. Negotiation, also I can't find any videos of people doing negotiation. Because in the process of negotiation, you're, you know, you're giving and taking. Nobody, everyone wants to be shown taking. Nobody wants to be seen giving. So that's why I think this shows me why I can't find any videos of critical thinking. Thanks. So let's, how much time do we have? Six. Six minutes? And uh, in change. Six minutes in change. Uh, oh, okay, let's go. Could you okay. start at 6.50? So, so John, please. Higher volume, please. Oh, yeah. So here John Cleese is talking about two modes of, of operating. Uh, he's talking about an open mode and a closed mode. And he says that creativity is only possible in an open mode. And I would say that also critical thinking is only possible in an open mode. So let's just listen to him talk a little bit about open and closed mode. Does it have to be a light bulb? How many doorkeepers? Well, let me explain a little. By the closed mode, I mean the mode that we are in most of the time when we're at work. We have inside us a feeling that there's lots to be done, and we have to get on with it if we're going to get through it all. It's an active, probably slightly anxious mode, although the anxiety can be exciting and pleasurable. It's a mode in which we're probably a little impatient, if only with ourselves. It has a little tension in it, not much humor. It's a mode in which we're very purposeful, and it's a mode in which we can get very stressed and even a bit manic, but not creative. By contrast, the open mode is, is relaxed, expansive, less purposeful, <coughs> in which we're probably more contemplative, uh, more inclined to humor, which always accompanies a wider perspective, and consequently, more playful. It's a mood in which curiosity for its own sake can operate, because we're not under pressure to get a specific thing done quickly. We can play, and that is what allows our natural creativity to serve. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. Okay, so he talks about the open mode where we can be creative. And a closed mode where we're kind of we have our nose to the grindstone. So we have five minutes. No, I mean go to the next. Okay, one. do you want to go? Okay, yeah, go to ten. Yeah, five ten. minutes. Okay. Yeah, we're fine. Relax. It will come. 
And, says the writer, of course, it finally always did. But, let me make one thing quite clear. We need to be in the open mode when we're pondering a problem. But, once we come up with a solution, we must then switch to the closed mode to implement it. Because once we've made a decision, we are efficient only if we go through with it decisively, undistracted by doubts about its correctness. For example, if you decide to leap a ravine, the moment just before takeoff is a bad time to start reviewing alternative strategies. When you're attacking a machine gun post, you should not make a particular effort to see the funny side of what you're doing. Humor is a natural concomitant of the open mode, but it's a luxury in the closed mode. No, once we've taken a decision, we should narrow our focus while we're implementing it. And then after it's been carried out, we should once again switch back to the open mode to review the feedback arising from our action in order to decide whether the course that we have taken is successful or whether we should continue with the next stage of our plan whether we should create an alternative plan to correct any error we perceive. And then, back into the closed mode again to implement that next stage, and so on. In other words, to be at our most efficient, we need to be able to switch backwards and forwards between the two modes. But, here's the... So, what I liked about this video was, you know, have you ever been in a situation where you say, I'm too busy to think, mm -hmm. right? So then, you're in the closed mode. You can't be creative or you can't do critical thinking. And, you know, sometimes that's the way it is, you know. You have many things to do and you just have to get them done, right? Then there's other times we have time, we have space, and we can think critically and creatively. So, this answers the question for me, you know, do I think critically enough, right? So, it's good that I don't have to think critically all the time. So, last is a teaching activity. So, how many minutes do we have? Uh, two. Oh, okay, good. First, ask the question, get the students in groups, ask them to brainstorm the question, why do we argue? And then they brainstorm that for five minutes, write the answers on the board, and discuss a little bit why we argue. Then, you give them this handout, which is the answers. <coughs> right? And you explain to them the four kinds of arguments, and how you use different arguments in dis different situations. Then the students write an example of when they do each one. And then they discuss with each other. And then this gives them, this puts, for me, this puts critical thinking into a context. So since I started teaching this, this style, no student asks me that question, you know, when do I do this? Right? It, this puts critical thinking into a context in their lives. Okay, so last one. So in conclusion, please embrace students' difficult questions. So sometimes you're teaching and a student throws a curveball at you and smacks you in the face. So if I just got angry at that student, hey, don't ask me that question, I'm the teacher, right? I didn't want to answer it, then I wouldn't have learned this. Because I embraced the question, I could learn more. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. We have some time for questions or comments. I'm just kind of curious to know, I mean, when I think of critical thinking, I think of it as maybe like a piece of art. It's hard to articulate, but you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, how do you quantify or how do you grade critical thinking among your students? <laughs> how, do you, how do you decide, well, that was critical thinking, so I'm going to give you an A. Versus, you didn't think very critically, so you might get a C. Okay, well, the first thing is, in the continuing education program, grades aren't that important. Right? So it's not like university. So I don't really worry about grading them, generally. So generally, I just give them the critical questions, let them work with it, and then I, you know, I can't look into their brain to find out if they're being open-minded or not. And so I, uh, I can't really say how I grade them. How do you assess them? How do I assess them? Well, I mean, in continuing education, assessment is not very important. So 90% of it is attendance, and then the rest is uh, participation. The participation. Yeah. It's not like in university where students are there for a grade. 
this is continuing education, so they're there just for their own benefit. Then, then, how do, I'm sorry. then how do you know if your students are developing critical thought if you're not assessing their ability to think critically? Okay, you think I should have a test at the end? No, I, I'm not saying yeah, that. Yeah. Because um, mm. I do a lot of this teaching in my classes as well. Yeah. And it's very difficult. I mean, mm. there doesn't seem to be a way to sort of quantify, quantify yeah. thinking. Mm. So I'm just trying to open it up for discussion. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I, I never bother with that question in my context. Yeah. So how, well, how do you know your students progressing then? I mean, if you're teaching that book, you said you teach them for mm. then 10 lessons or something? Yeah. So what sort of feedback do you get from the students in terms of the progression of their critical thoughts? So at the end of the course, there is a you know, feedback form. And on the website, they post the students' what, comments. So uh, this course helped me think in a different way or something like that. So. I was just going to say self self-evaluation might be a way to do it. Mm, yeah. But do you teach maybe how to see critical thinking, not necessarily how to use Like These are the, the ways in which critical thinking is developed. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily evaluating them on the actual development of that skill. And that's so, the, the, base, like the context you're in is not yeah. necessarily using it. It's just these are the skills, these are the skills you can use. So yeah, like I said, I don't, I haven't really thought about, you know, evaluation, right? So it's just not in my context, not that important. I was kind of waiting to hear you say the word analysis. When you said what's critical thinking, you mm. told us it's logic, right? It's mm. these you didn't sort of bring in analysis, and for me that's kind of like a big part. Perhaps it's just a semantic term, but I think in terms of, you know, when we ask students to do things or we give students exercises, mm. we have to ask them to analyze and mm. be able to recognize. Yeah. Okay. I okay. In my mind, yeah. I would put logic and analysis in one box, oh. and I would put open-mindedness in another box. Okay. So you could be very analytical without thinking critically, without having an open mind. Oh, I see. Um, do you do you think there's only one? approach towards critical thinking without using very cultural variations. I mean, I think some people might say this, this is very much a Western yeah. approach to mm. there are, thinking and you know, there are maybe other yeah. approaches. I am coming from the Western approach. There, the other main approach is through Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Buddha has a lot of, uh, oh, I can't remember the quotes now, but there, yeah. Look, what Socrates is for Western style critical thinking, the Buddha was to Eastern style critical thinking. So there is another, like, another way of thinking about it. But there are lots of parallels. We will have to leave it there. But uh, everyone, round of applause for Peter Quinn. Thank you.